Allow me to begin on a personal note. This is a picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass surgeries, basically run out of plumbing at some point, confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people. Francis Gregor, my grandmother, arrived at one of Pritikin's early sessions in a wheelchair. Mrs. Gregor had heart disease, anginal claudication, her condition so bad she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks though, she's not only out of her wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. This is a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding 15 years after doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet till age 96 to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Now, years later, when Dr. Dionarch published his landmark lifestyle heart trial proving with something called quantitative angiography that indeed heart disease could be reversed. Arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. I assumed this was gonna be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, yet nothing happened. I said, wait a second, if effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be out there in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those who are unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world. So busy folks like you, don't have to. Very nice. <laughs> um, I then compile all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, the most practical findings and new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, uh, no corporate sponsorship, strictly non commercial, not selling anything. I just put it up as a public service, as a, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. So where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what may be one of the most important advances in health, according to one of our most important medical figures of the last century, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that many of our major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary artery disease was almost non-existent. I say, wait a second, our number one killer almost non-existent? What were they eating? Well, they're eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein almost exclu exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in kind of modern day plant eaters. So wait a second, maybe they were just all dying early, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age-matched heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Now 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Now, 632 age and gender matched autopsies in Uganda, excuse me, in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they were so blown away, went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death, out of 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand. Whereas here, uh, 
heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here and in places that eat and live like the U.S., but were rare or even non-existent among populations centering their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our most common diseases, like obesity, for example, hiatal hernia, the most common stomach problem in the world, varicose veins and hemorrhoids, the two most common venous problems, um, uh, colorectal cancer, our leading cancer killer. Diverticulosis, the most common disease of the intestines. Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery. Gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, our commonest cause of death here, but a rarity among plant-based populations, right? which suggests that heart disease may be a choice. Like cavities. Like if you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives. No flossing. Yet no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet, right? Okay, so why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through dietary changes? Well, well, simple. Because the pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine, right? If you're an adult, you think the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family, then go for it. I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence I've got a good dental plan. But what if instead of the plaque in our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries, another disease that can be prevented through changes in our diet. Okay, now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now, what are the consequences for you and your family, right? It's, of course, up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Um, we can end up uh, uh, more than just uh, diseased, but dead as well. Our atherosclerosis is a disease that begins in childhood by age 10. Nearly all children raised in the standard American diet already have what are called fighting streaks building up inside of their arteries, uh, the first stage of the disease. These streaks then turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. And our heart is called a heart attack, and our brain, the same disease, can cause a stroke. So if there's anyone here this evening, older than age, 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have, whether you know it or not. But is that even possible? You know, when researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that do not get epidemic heart disease, their hope was, hey, maybe we could slow the disease down a little bit, maybe even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating the artery clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. This remarkable improvement in blood flow to the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks of plant-based nutrition. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes under the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table and get all red hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but 
will heal naturally if you just stand back, let your body work its magic. Okay, but what if you whack your shin the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> You'd never heal. You'd go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. They'd be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write your prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Still really hurts like heck, but oh, it feels so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. It's like when people take nitroglycerin pills for crushing chest pain, tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the underlying cause of the disease. It's like, um, I mean, our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. The most amazing things I learned in all my years of medical training here in Boston was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually, it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until wham, first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is to just stand back, get out of the way, stop re-injuring ourselves, and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. Within weeks, the body, the human body, was designed as a self-healing machine. Sure, you can choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer, but why beat yourself up at all? This is nothing new. American Heart Journal, 1977. Cases like Mr. FW here. Heart disease so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. All right. Now, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. Cost thousands of dollars a year, but hey, at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. Does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper. They can work better because you're treating the underlying cause of the disease. Heart disease is our number one killer. Killer number two is cancer. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Well, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues were able to be the first to show a reversal of the progression, on average, of early stage prostate cancer with the same plant-based diet and lifestyle program, and no wonder. If you take the blood of, men, of many in the standard American diet and drip their blood on cancer cells, uh, prostate cancer cells growing in a Petri dish, um, you can suppress the growth of those cells, because your body's fighting it off, uh, by about 9%. Um, but you take people, put them on a plant-based diet for a year, and their blood can do this. Nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now, this was in men with prostate cancer. They wanted to repeat this study using women and breast cancer, the number one cancer killer among young women. Uh, but look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different lines of human breast cancer. This is the before cancer cells growth powering away at 100%. This is after eating healthy for those two weeks. This is a before picture. This is a photomicrograph. A photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is they laid down a confluent layer of breast cancer, like a carpet of breast cancer, 
And then they drip the blood of women eating the standard American diet onto that cancer. And you can see it kind of breaks the cancer up into these kind of cancer continents here. Then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and retest two weeks later. So they act as their own controls. This is the before. Put them on a plant-based diet for two weeks, lay down another of carpet of cancer, drip their blood two weeks later, and all you're left with is that. Just a few individual cancer cells left. Their bodies cleaned up. Before and after. Just two weeks eating healthy. Uh, their bloodstream became that much more inhospitable to cancer. Suppressing cancer cell growth is nice, getting rid of it. It's even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death, where their bodies are able to kind of reprogram cancer cells, forcing them to early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots, for example, here. So even if you're a woman eating a pretty poor diet, you're not totally defenseless. You can knock off a few cancer cells. But then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet for two weeks, and two weeks later, their blood can do that. It's like you're an entirely different person inside. The same blood now circulating throughout these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating healthy. Uh, what kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? All right, do we want blood that you know, just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop it? Now this remarkable strengthening of our cancer defenses was after two weeks of plant-based diet and exercise. They did have these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. Okay, so you say, wait a second, if you do two things, uh, how do you know what role the diet played? So researchers decided to put it to the test. This is what we saw before this measuring cancer cell clearance. This cancer cell clearance of someone eating a plant-based diet along with daily uh, mild exercise, like just out walking every day. In this case, in this study, for an average of 14 years. Plant-based diet and walking um, uh, every day, 14 years, that's the kind of cancer cell clearance you get. Compare that to the cancer-stopping power of your average sedentary American. See a little cheeseburger there, I don't know if you quite catch that. Um, which is essentially non-existent. Okay, but here's the interesting group here. What about the group in the middle there? What about 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics? <laughs> they wanted to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over there? And the answer was exercise helped, no question, but literally five, thousand hours in the gym was no match for a plant-based diet. Here's that same tunnel imaging we saw before. Um, again, even if you're a couch potato living off of fried potatoes, you're not totally defenseless, so you can kill off a few cancer cells. You exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill off cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. And this is because we think of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, a cancer-promoting growth hormone. The, the consumption of animal protein, meat, egg white, and dairy protein, increases the levels in our bloodstream of this cancer-promoting growth hormone um, uh, involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors, but if we start eating healthy, we drop our consumption of animal protein, our levels of IGF-1 drop within weeks, and benefits continue to accrue the longer we eat healthy. And our levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is like our body's emergency break. It's one of our ways our body protects itself from excessive growth, uh, from cancer. So sure, in as few as two weeks, you can drop your um, uh, production of IGF-1, but wait a second. What about all the IGF-1 you have circulating in your system from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Well, your liver releases the snatch squad of binding proteins to type in the excess IGF-1, pull it out of the system, 
Your protective levels go up within weeks and benefits continue to accrue the longer you eat healthy. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. Same thing before, healthy diet and exercise, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. Here's the interesting column here though. What if you add back to the cancer? Just the amount of IGF-1 you banish from your system because you started eating healthier, what happens? you effectively erase the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating healthy at all. So that's why we think that, uh, you know, some of the largest studies on diet and cancer in history have found that the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based because they're eating less animal protein, less meat, egg, white, and dairy protein, Meaning, and so they have lower levels of IGF-1 in their system, um, which means less cancer growth. How much less cancer growth are we talking about? Um, well, um, thousands of women um, were uh, followed for 18 years, and those during middle age, eating lots of uh, protein, 75% increased risk of overall of dying prematurely for anything, and then fourfold risk, quadrupling risk of dying specifically from cancer, but not plant protein, right? This is not, so this is specifically for animal protein, which of course makes sense given the IGF-1 connection we just talked about. The academic institution where the study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line that chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. Explaining, look, quadrupling your risk of dying from, from uh, cancer? I mean, that's comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. So what was the reaction in the scientific community to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it's potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking? My ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me. <laughs> so let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and dairy. To shh. That reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing your risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking you know, one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer. Or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, multiplying your risk sixfold if you eat lots of meat and dairy. So, they conclude, well, let's keep some perspective here. The risk from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities, so breathe deep. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot so much worse. Uh, how about neither, right? <laughs> Two risks, don't make a right. Of course, you'll note Philip Moore stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <clears throat> Just saying. All right, we talked about killer number one, um, uh, heart disease, killer number two, cancer. Now, every year, uh, the CDC compiles the top 15 leading cause of death. I thought, let, let's just go through the list, one through 15. Talk about the role diet may play in preventing, arresting, or reversing each of our top 15 killers. Two down. 13 to go. Um, uh, the top three killers used to be heart disease, cancer, stroke. Oh, that's so 2007. Now it's heart disease, cancer, and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema. Thankfully, eating healthily can reduce one's risk of getting COPD, can even help treat COPD, significantly improving lung function over time, something we didn't even thought possible. We thought people would just get worse, worse, worse till they died until they tried fruits and vegetables. And whether it was the antioxidant effect or the anti-inflammatory effect, actually improved lung function over time, people with COPD. Now, the tobacco industry viewed these findings a little differently. Right? If adding plants to our diet can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to just add plants to cigarettes? And indeed, 
The addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition of fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties a distinct purplish color, kind of turned people off a little bit. Um, uh, although evidently you can't improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you, if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice, you can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, uh, though there were some complaints of the grape seed particles becoming visible in the final product. And, you know, look, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters is that they're picky about what goes in their food. Oh, pig anus? Oh, but grapes eat. Oh. <laughs> All right, now killer number four is indeed stroke. Preventing strokes may be all about eating potassium-rich foods, yet most Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium. By most, I mean more than 98%. More than 98% of Americans eat potassium deficient diets because more than 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants, right? Potassium comes from the words potash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce it to ash, you're left with potassium, potassium, so called vegetable alkali. But who can name me one plant food in particular? I have potassium? But of course, bananas. You know, it's funny, I, you know, I speak all around the world and that's like the it's like the one thing everybody seems to know about nutrition. I don't know, like Chiquita must have a good PR firm or something. I don't know. It's, it turns out bananas don't even make the top 50 sources of potassium. Coming in at number 86, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes fast, and then bananas. It's funny when I was uh, writing the new book, um, you know, I went back to check the USDA nutrient database and they've actually span expanded it now. Bananas don't even make the top thousand sources coming into number 1,161 right after Reese's Pieces. I kid you not. <laughs> um, if you really want your potassium, the most concentrated sources in the American diet, number one, greens. Number two, beans. And number three, dates, the dried fruit dates. Bananas, again, don't even make the top uh, thousand. In fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's is next. Four million Americans affected. Um, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago, wasn't even in the top 10. Uh, according to the latest dietary guidelines for the prevention of Alzheimer's, the two most important things we can do, number one, cut down our intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and increase our intake of vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, uh, fruits, whole grains. And this is based in part on data going back decades now to the original um, Adventist study showing that those who eat meat Red meat, white meat, doesn't matter. Two, two to three times the risk of becoming demented later in life, and the longer they ate healthy, the lower their risk appeared to drop. Killer number seven, type two diabetes, a disease we've known we can both prevent, arrest, and reverse since the 1930s, where a small group of diabetics were put on a plant-based diet, and over a period of five years, about a quarter of them were able to get off their insulin altogether, but plant-based diets tend to be relatively low-calorie diets, and so maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, what you'd have to do is put people on a plant-based diet but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Right? Then we could see if there's unique benefits to plant-based eating beyond just all the easy weight loss. All right, well, we'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. Subjects were weighed every day. 
And if they started to lose weight, they're made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food. Some of the participants have problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Oh. But eventually they adapted. So no weight loss despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk. Okay, so with zero weight loss, was there still any benefit to their diabetes? Well, insulin needs were cut 60% across the board. Half the diabetics ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow, how many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics who've had diabetes as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years and then off all insulin in less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet. For decades, they were just 13 days away at any time. Here's participant number 15. 32 units of insulin on the control diet, then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units, less insulin. That's the power of plants. And remember, this was with zero weight loss, right? His body just started working that much better. The way he was designed, his body was designed to work. And what about the side effects though? Okay, how about cholesterol's dropping like a rock to under 150? Again, only about two weeks time. Making him essentially heart attack proof too, just as a bonus. You know, just like asking patients to make moderate changes in diet, will only net them kind of moderate benefits in terms of cholesterol reduction. How moderate do you want your diabetes? Everything in moderation is a truer statement than many people realize. Asking diabetics to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, moderate kidney failure, moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Remember that study that purported to show that diets high meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful for the health of smoking? Um, I supposedly found that those who eat a lot of animal protein in middle age most meat, eggs, and dairy four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. Well, that was true for cancer, but if you look at the actual study for diabetes, that was simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein in middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Now, those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Kidney, um, uh, kidney failure is the eighth leading killer in the United States, a disease we can both prevent and treat with a plant-based diet, and no wonder kidneys are highly vascular organs, so no wonder that Harvard researchers found three dietary risk factors and only three for declining kidney function. Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. And number three, cholesterol. Animal fat can alter the actual structure of the human kidney um, based on studies like this showing plugs of fat literally kind of clogging up the works in autopsy to human kidneys. And animal protein can have a profound effect on normal kidney function inducing something called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. So if you give folks a single meal of tuna fish, single meal of tuna fish, you can see increased pressure in their kidneys one, two, three hours after the meal in both non-diabetics and diabetics. Okay, but what if instead of a tuna fish salad sandwich, they had a tofu salad sandwich? What happens? Absolutely nothing. Our bodies can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. Same amount of protein, but in plant protein form, no problem for our kidneys. You say, well, wait a second. Why does animal protein cause that overload reaction, but not plant protein? 
Well, we think it's because the inflammation triggered by the consumption of animal products, and how do we know that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that hyperfiltration protein leakage response to meat ingestion. And then there's the acid load. The consumption of foods such as meat, dairy, uh, meat, eggs, and dairy induces the formation of acids within um, our kidneys, um, so, um, uh, um, which causes something called tubular toxicity damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within our kidneys. Animal foods tend to be acid-promoting, particularly fish, which is the worst, and pork, poultry, on down the list, whereas plant foods either be kind of neutral or actually base-forming alkaline, particularly dark green leafy vegetables, to counteract some of the acids formed from an otherwise unhealthy diet. So maybe the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney disease may lie in the produce aisle or the farmer's market rather than the pharmacy. And so no surprise that plant-based diets have been used to treat kidney failure for decades now. Um, this is protein leakage on the standard low sodium diet. This is what we physicians would typically put people on with failing kidneys. But then they switched them in this study to the supplemented vegan diet, um, then back to conventional, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on simply what was going into their mouths. Killer number nine, respiratory infections like pneumonia. You say, well, what possible role could diet play in respiratory infections. Well, obviously you haven't seen my video on kale and the immune system talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> Boosting antibody production sevenfold. Yeah, but that's in a Petri dish. What about in people? If you take older men and women, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, right before getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination, you split them up into two groups, half to eat their regular diet, the other half, you just add a few servings of fruits and vegetables, you get a significantly improved boosted antibody protective response um, uh, uh, in the fruit and vegetable group. This is not cutting out meat. This is just adding a few servings of produce to one's daily diet can significantly boost immune function, which for some people, um, can be literally um, life-saving. Killer number 10 is suicide. Now we've known for a long time that people who eat healthier tend to feel healthier. In fact, only about half of the uh, depression, anxiety, and stress scores compared to those eating more typical diets. Um, what they thought was going on is that um, they thought it was this arachidonic acid. This is this long chain inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid uh, found in uh, animal products, uh, mostly in uh, chicken and eggs, um, but also beef sausage on down the list, but predominantly chicken and eggs. So what researchers did is they took people, removed eggs, removed chicken, removed other meat from people's diet, and got a significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. Man, it can take some drugs months to take an effect. Right? Significant improvement in mood within two weeks. And so what they think was going on was this arachidonic acid stuff was adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation. But we may be able to clear this information from our brains within just two weeks by cutting down our intake of eggs, chicken, and other meat. And you say, wait a second. Am I just cherry picking here? What about all the other diets that have been proven to improve mood? There aren't any. So um, here's a, um, a meta-analysis that looked at all the studies um, done to date and only that single plant-based dietary intervention was able uh, to show in a, in a randomized controlled um, a rigorous trial to improve mood over any time span. It's hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. 
Um, oh, works in a workplace setting too. This is at Geico Insurance. What they did is they went in and offered weekly educational seminars like this um, and um, added healthy options to the cafeteria at the work place, and they got significantly increases, not only in physical function, general health, vitality, all the things you'd expect eating healthier, but also improvements in mental health. And that led to subsequent improved worker performance. Um, and so they're like, oh, okay. So they took it nationwide, 10 corporate sites across the country at Geico, half continued to do the regular thing, no change. The other half, what they did is they did the same thing went in, gave these weekly educational sessions, just added healthy options, didn't take anything away, added lentil soup and bean burritos, healthy options in the cafeteria, and what happened, significant improvements, depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functioning, uh, improved mo uh, emotional health. So, lifestyle interventions like exercise don't just have physical benefits, but can have mental health benefits as well in terms of diet, plant-based diets, have the greatest evidence base to support them. Killer number 10 is uh, systemic blood infections. Now, sure, um, uh, you know, foodborne bacteria can burrow through the intestinal wall, get into your bloodstream, or in women actually crawl up from their bladder. We've known for decades now um, that, um, that the, the, the urinary tract infection bacteria um, start off in the rectum and then creep up into the bladder. We didn't know where the original source of these UTI-causing um, bladder bugs were, um, but now we do. Chicken. Chicken is a reservoir so for these so-called extra-intestinal um, E. coli. Um, uh, this is, uh, we have, so we have this now DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link between um, you know, uh, chickens, meat, and um, uh, bladder infection uh, cultures. Um, taken from women with bladder infections. Um, solid evidence that urinary tract infections can be what's called a zoonosis or an animal to human disease. He said, wait a second, who undercooks chicken? Can't you just use a meat thermometer, cook the meat through? What's the big deal? The big deal is what's called cross-contamination. If you take 40 families, you give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their home as they normally would, and multitudes of antibiotic-resistant bacteria jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before they eat it. So you could incinerate that chicken to ash. <laughs> you don't even have to eat any of it. You're already infected before it makes it into the pot. Um, within days, the chicken bacteria had multiplied to the point of becoming a major part of the person's gut floor. Chicken bacteria was like taking over. So you say, okay, wait a second. What about instead of just giving people safe cooking guidelines, you give them safe handling guidelines too? So they went in, instructed people on the official USDA recommendation, what we should all be doing is spraying all common surfaces um, with a bleach solution anytime um, uh, fresh or frozen poultry comes in the house. Um, they told people how to do this, showed people how to do this, did the same thing, went in afterwards and swabbed around their kitchen um, and still, found significant levels of Salmonella Campylobacter. These are serious human pathogens um, on some utensils, dishcloth, counter, rim around the sink, cupboard. The reason that most families have more bacteria from feces in their kitchen sink compared to their toilet seat is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. <laughs> Chicken in every pot, but not that one. <laughs> um, all right, but the good news is, it's not like you eat chicken once and you're colonized for life. The chicken bacteria only seem to last in these experiments for about 10 days for your good bacteria to kind of muscle it out of the way. The problem is that many families consume chicken more than once every 10 days. So maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs in their systems, which can lay in wait in the rectum, um, and then crawl up later and cause millions of bladder infections um, every year, which is not just a nuisance, but sometimes can actually become quite serious um, and even life-threatening. So wait a second, you can't sell unsafe cars, you can't sell unsafe toys, how is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumer. Raw meats are not idiot-proof, says one USDA poultry microbiologist. Look, they're like, um, uh, they can be mishandled and when they are, it's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's gonna get hurt. 
Now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, our, our poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer that has their most responsibility, just refuses to accept it. Uh, it's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt or something. Um, uh, the uh, head of the CDC's food poisoning division was famously, famously responded to this kind of meat industry blame the victim attitude. Is it reasonable, she asked. Is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They now have FDA approval for a bacteria-eating virus that they can spray on the meat. Um, now, there's been some concern about these so-called um, bacteriophages may present some of a challenge to the food industry, so of course they're not going to label it or anything. Uh, but if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effective extracted housefly pupae, I'm poor, this is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, it's a low cost, think about it. Look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. So, hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacterial something inside, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I didn't think so. <laughs> so, let's take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, towel them off, a little Vitamix action here, voila, safer meats. We talked about kidney failure. What about liver failure? We've known for decades now you can actually treat liver failure with a plant-based diet, significantly reducing toxins that would otherwise build up eating meat without a fully functional liver to detoxify your blood. Though it's true there are some folks consuming plant-based diets with worsening liver function. They're called alcoholics living off of barley and potatoes and, and, and grapes and strictly plant-based, but not doing so good. We're not sure exactly. <clears throat> Killer number 13, high blood pressure. 78 million Americans affected. We're talking one in three American adults. And as we get older, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, most of us have high blood pressure. So wait a second, if most of us are, you know, hypertensive when we get older, maybe it's less a disease and more just a natural inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. A thousand people had their blood pressure tested in rural Kenya. Uh, a typical Kenyan diet, something like this, a lot of corn and beans and vegetables, fruit, greens. Our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures go down. And the lower, the better. We now have evidence even people under 120 over 80 may benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. One ten, is it even possible? To get pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those living healthy enough lives. Two years to this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Mm, zero. Wow, they must have low rates of heart disease, right? No, they had no rates of heart disease, not a single case of atherosclerosis. Our number one killer was found. Rural China, same thing. About 110 over 70, their entire lives, 70 year olds, same average blood pressure as 16 year olds. So we see an Asian diet, African diet, vastly different diets. What they shared in common is that they're plant based day to day with meat only eaten on special occasions. Right? So, well, why do we think it's the plant based nature of their diets that was so protective? Because in the Western world, the only groups of folks getting it down that low on average, according to the American Heart Association, are those eating strictly plant-based diets, coming in at an average of about 110 over 65. This is the largest study of plant-based eaters to date. This is looking at 89,000 Californians 
comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or, or flexitarians, people they meet more like on a once a week basis rather than a, than a daily basis. Um, compared to those we know meat except fish, compared to those we know meat at all, compared to those we know meat, eggs, or dairy. And this was an Adventist study, so um, uh, where you know, they, they, they consider their body a temple. And so even the non-vegetarians that tend not to smoke, exercise a lot, lots of fruits and vegetables, didn't eat a lot of meat. But this is a really healthy cohort of meat eaters, but still, you saw this stepwise drop in risk, the more and more plant-based they ate. Um, same thing with diabetes, same thing with obesity. So yeah, sure, you could throw the vast majority of your risk out the window by eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along this spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant benefits. You can show this experimentally, like for high blood pressure, you take vegetarians, you give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who already eat meat, remove meat from the diet, their blood pressure goes down within seven days. And this is after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications. They had to. I mean, you can't treat the cause. You can't have normal blood pressure and be on multiple blood pressure medications, you drop your pressure too low, I mean, get dangerous, get lightheaded, fall over, hurt yourself. So they had to wean people off these drugs. So lower pressures on fewer drugs in seven days. That's the power of plants. So does the American Art Association recommend a no meat diet? I know they recommend the so-called DASH diet, actually in the news a lot this week because the new hypertension guidelines came up. Um, before 140, um, uh, you know, 140 over 90, that was considered hypertension. Now they've dropped it down to 130 as being high, high blood pressure. But as we saw, really anything over 110 is really hot. I mean, it's, it's abnormally high, but they're talking about putting people at really high risk. And what do they do is they say to people eat the DASH diet, this low meat diet. So wait a second, why not entirely plant-based? I mean, when the DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a more plant-based diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. Uh, they didn't think the public could handle the truth. Now, you can see what they were thinking. Just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, diets never work at all unless you actually eat them, so like, look, we can't tell, how many people, if we tell eat strictly plant-based, how many people are gonna do that, right? So if we soft pedal the message, come up with some kind of compromised diet, well then, we'll, uh, you know, on a population scale, we'll save more lives. Okay, okay, tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. Kill number 14 is Parkinson's disease. It's a plant-based diet reduce one's risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Well, we know that most studies done to date have found a link between dairy product consumption and increased risk of Parkinson's. Why might that be? Um, well, there's evidence that our uh, milk supply is contaminated with neurotoxic chemicals. They're talking, so for example, you see high levels of these certain organochlorine pesticides found not only in the milk supply, but in the certain regions of the brain on autopsy implicated for the disease. I'm talking about uh, toxins like tetrahydrisoquinoline, which is what scientists use to actually cause Parkinson's in primates in a laboratory setting, found mostly in cheese. Um, actually, and so there's been calls on the dairy industry to pretty please test um, their milk, their, their, uh, their um, products for toxins. Good luck with that. Um, of course, look, you could just not drink it, but then what would happen to your bones? 
That's a marketing ploy. If you look at the actual science, milk does not appear to protect against hip fracture risk. Whether you're drinking it as an adult, whether you're drinking it as a teen, doesn't matter, doesn't work. It may actually increase risk of hip fracture, which may explain why com countries with the you know, highest hip fracture rates are among those with the highest dairy consumption. So Swedish researchers decided to put it to the test. More than 100,000 men and women followed for years, and milk-drinking women had higher rates of what? Higher rates of death from all causes. Um, so lived significantly shorter lives, more cardiovascular disease, significantly more cancer for each daily glass of milk. Um, uh, those women unfortunate enough to be drinking three glasses of milk a day had nearly twice the risk of dying prematurely. Right? And they had more bone and hip fracture risk too, more milk, more fractures. And milk drinking men also had higher rates of death. But for some reason, uh, you never see milk ads like this. I'm not sure exactly what the. <coughs> <laughs> and finally, a killer number 15 aspiration pneumonia was caused by swallowing difficulties due to Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or stroke, things you've already talked about. Okay, so here's our top 15 causes of death. And a plant based diet can be used to help prevent nearly all of them can be used to treat more than half of them and even reverse the course of disease in some of them, including, in some cases, our top three killers. Now look, there, you know, certainly there are drugs that can help too. There's cholesterol statin, you know, uh, drugs for cholesterol lowering standards for heart. Um, uh, there's insulin injections, various uh, oral sugar pills for diabetes. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different classes of high blood pressure medications you can put people on, but the same diet does it all. It's not like there's you know, some kind of brain healthy diet that's somehow different from a heart healthy diet. No, a kidney healthy diet is a liver healthy diet, is a whole body healthy diet, one diet to kind of rule them all. And, uh, and what about side effects? I'm not talking about a little rash here or something. Prescription drugs kill. More than 100,000 Americans every year. This is, we're not talking about opiate overdoses. We're not talking about uh, medical errors, giving people the wrong drug or prescribing. No, this is drugs as taken, killing off more than 100,000 people every year. So wait a second, 106,000 deaths? That means that the sixth leading cause of death in America is doctors. The sixth leading cause of death is me. Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. Um, no, seriously, compared to 15,000 American vegetarians, um, those that eat meat, about twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, and acids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, as well as insulin. So plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking drugs, for people that don't like paying for drugs, and for people that don't like risking drug side effects. Right? Anyone want to solve the healthcare crisis? I do have a suggestion. You know, there's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, that's a plant-based diet. So, like any time anyone tries to sell you on some new diet they heard about, do me a favor. Ask them one simple question. Wait a second, has this diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, number one reason me and all my loved ones will die? If the answer is no, why would you even consider it? If that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women. Uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet until proven otherwise? And the fact that it can also be effective in preventing, arresting, or reversing other leading killers, like type two diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most deaths in the United States are preventable and related to nutrition. According to the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of disease risk factors in history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the number one cause of death in these United States, it's our diet. The number one cause of disability in the United States, it's our diet. Now bumping tobacco smoking to number two, cigarettes, oh, they only kill about a half million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. So if most deaths are preventable and related to nutrition, then obviously nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school, right? 
Now, obviously, it's the number one thing your doctor talks about at every single visit, right? How could there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Well, let me end with a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. You know, back in the 1950s, the average per capita cigarette consumption was 4,000 cigarettes a year, meaning the average person walking around smoked half pack a day, on average. The media was telling people to smoke, famous athletes agreed, even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. I mean, look, you want to keep fit? and stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim, and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? <laughs> Though apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for a youth oil. They wanted to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative power is claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better be safe than sorry and smoke. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. No woman ever says no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. Back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Sure, you know, some doctors smoked camels, but others preferred lucky. So there was a little disagreement there. The leader of the US Senate agreed. Who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Maybe over in Flint, Michigan. <clears throat> But don't worry, if your throat does get irritated, your doctor can always write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when the AMA is saying that smoking on balance is good for you, when the American Medical Association is saying that, where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts? Or what's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is when he still could speak, before he died of throat cancer. You know, by some miracle back then, there was some kind of smokingfacts.org website that could deliver the science directly, right? bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters. You would have become aware of studies like this. This is an Adventist study out of California, published in 1958 showing that non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. But this wasn't the first. When famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why st studies back in the 30s linking smoking and cancer were simply ignored, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was everywhere. It was in the movies, airplanes, medical meetings where one heavy haze of smoke smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our little thought experiment here. If you're a smoker in the 50s, in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, could have cancer by then. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you could be dead by then. 
It took more than 25 years. It took more than 7,000 studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You'd think maybe after the first 6,000 studies, it could give people a little heads up or something? <laughs> Powerful industry. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. But as a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, well, let's fast forward 55 years. You know there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouths. Of course, it's not just one study. Put all the studies together. Mortality from all causes put together. Many of our dreaded diseases significantly lower among those eating more plant-based. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize that the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habit not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it could be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the AMA went on record refusing to endorse it. Why? Could it have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. Okay, so we can see why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't more individual doctors speaking up? There were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics of dietary disease. Uh, what was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry used the same misinformation, twisting the science. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of cigarettes and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Whereas animal products and processed foods are killing off 14 million lives every year. Those of us involved in this evidence-based nutrition revolution, we're talking about 14 million souls every year. So maybe plant-based eating should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of quitting smoking. How long do we have to wait, though, before the CDC says, don't wait for open-heart surgery uh, to start eating healthier as well? Until the system changes, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We can't wait until society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. Now, Dr. Kim Williams, became president recently of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked in an interview why he himself eats the same diet he recommends to all his patients, the strictly plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. Thank you so much. <laughs>